should have a copy of today's sermon, and you can follow along. Should be some blanks for you to uh, fill in, and you can do that as I move through the message. In our Bible training class, which meets at 9.30, and I hope you'll make yourself available to get under that teaching. They started today a teaching on the book of Revelation. And that didn't prompt me to preach on this message, but I am talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that will kind of go hand in go- in hand in glove with what I'm saying this morning. Interesting, when uh, you examine pulpits across the United States, maybe even in other places, that a lot of preachers shy away from preaching on the second coming. They're either silent about it or ignore it. And as a result, the body of Christ has little instruction concerning this important doctrine of the gospel of Christ. We know the quintessence of the heart of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the gospel, the good news, is everything that Jesus said, taught, and what he's still doing in our hearts and lives. And one of the great doctrines of uh, the gospel of Christ, of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the second coming. And there's, I think, a lot of questions and uh, a lot of interest in anything that is yet to happen. When you look at the Bible, most of the prophetic words that have been spoken have been fulfilled. And one of the dangers of interpreting, say, the book of Zechariah, Daniel, the book of Revelation, is that people try to take something that's been fulfilled and put it in a future tense. When you do that, you miss out on what God was saying. The Lord is still working and moving, and and we can see as we have an ear to hear what the Spirit of God is saying that there are a lot of things happening in our world today that we find true and relevant within the Scriptures. One thing that Paul says to the church of Thessalonica, he said, Christ is coming back. We acknowledge the fact that the first event, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as a baby, as a lamb, but he's coming back as one who is a lion, one who is a conqueror, and he's going to make everything right. Amen? One thing that's clear in, in the book of Thessalonica, the first and second book of this epistle, is that Christ's return is clear, that the dead in Christ shall be resurrected, even though their spirit and soul is in the presence of God, that in fulfillment of everything that Christ has done, he's going to make us complete and give this old body a resurrected, glorified body. Also, it says that those who are living at the return of Christ on this earth shall be translated. So what does that mean to you and me? Every believer, I'm talking about not a Christian, you know, which... Today is a term that's wide brushed. But I'm talking about a person who is a believer, who is a follower of Jesus Christ, who knows in their heart and life they've been changed and transformed by the might of the power of God. The Holy Ghost lives within them. They're being sanctified by the Spirit of God, growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. What they say and how they live their life is according to the word of God, and you see the evidence that they are born again, that they're a new creature in Christ Jesus, that they know their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. They're not wondering, am I lost today? Am I saved today? What's going on? You can look at their life, and you can say, hey, 
I see that validates, or the scripture validates what's happening in that person's life. Therefore, every follower of Jesus, every person who's born again, will witness the second coming. He said that to Daniel, reassured Daniel. Daniel said, well, what does this all mean? He said, you're not going to miss out. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And those saints who remain shall be caught up with the Lord. Amen? So hallelujah. You experience the first coming by faith in Jesus Christ. I look back, you look back to the cross. Amen? By faith we look to an oncoming king. Amen? Now, when you look at Revelation, when people try to interpret apocalyptical symbolic language, the Bible, when we look at it, when we see that truth is literal, it is real, you can bank on it. But when you attempt to interpret the truth of God's word, you've got to ask yourself, is this to be taken literally? Is this prophetic? How is this being presented? For example, when I read that Jesus is the door, I don't take that literally. Jesus is not a piece of wood and hinges. When I look at Jesus, he's the Lamb of God. I don't see a little baby lamb. I, I see what that symbolic language is saying. Most of the language you see in the book of Revelation is symbolic, ap apocalyptical language. And you have to understand who it was written to and why it was written to that first century church, the persecution, the intimidation, the attack upon the church. And Revelation is primarily a revelation of Jesus Christ, not so much end times. It does make reference to the second coming. And so you have to say, what good would it do these people in the first century church if everything was happening in the future? How is that going to comfort them when someone's putting a knife to their throat and saying, are you going to turn to my authority and my rule and renounce your faith in Christ or not? Our nation has not undergone the persecution as we've seen in the former Soviet Union for believers, or in China, or in some Middle East countries. We haven't had someone say to you, to me, and put a gun to our head or a knife to our throat, will you yield to Allah? Will you bend your knee and embrace this doctrine, this faith, and for you to do that, you must renounce your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous sake. Now, today in our country, followers of Jesus, I'm talking about those who are sold out to God, unfortunately we find ourselves in the minority. I heard one preacher say, the United Apostate Church, the United Apostate States of America. And we're going to talk about apostasy this morning as we examine this scripture in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, probably the most controversial and difficult passages in all of the Bible because of the heated debate that takes place. Am I going to be silent about it? Am I going to ignore it? Am I going to say, well, I don't want to talk about this because... I don't understand everything here. Does every, anybody understand everything in the Bible? Now, we're dependent on the Holy Spirit to give us revelation and understanding and open our eyes spiritually and our ears spiritually so we can see, we can hear, and we can embrace the truth of God's Word. Let me read the Scripture to you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and by the gathering together unto him, that ye not be soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who letteth, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish because they receive not the love of truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion, and they shall believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but hath pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obeying of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold the tradition which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and, the God, and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Bless the reading of God's word. Now, this letter was to a church in York, northern Greece. And the purpose of this letter, he's writing to these people at Thessalonica concerning the second coming of Christ. Some of the people believed that Christ had already returned and some of them were believing that his return was very soon or imminent. Now, I grew up in a good Bible-believing church and one thing that was emphasized over and over was the second coming is imminent. I remember as a young boy going back into the foyer and there were newspapers on a table stacked up and it was pictures of planes crashing because the pilot was a believer and he was snatched out and all those other people went down the tube, boom, And then it had pictures of a husband and wife, and one was taken, one was left. And I said, my goodness, I think I'm going to get saved again. (laughs) And any moment, you know. But when I read the Bible, you know, what you've got to do is you need to interpret the Bible based on the truth of God's Word and look at just not one scripture, but you got to look at the whole Bible. You got to examine things within context. You got to use that good old Holy Ghost common sense hermeneutics. And so uh, you would learn things and hear things, and then I'd read the Bible and say, wait a minute. What I thought my so-called theology, thinking about God, isn't really lining up with what the Scripture says. And so Paul says, you people, I want to reassure you and comfort you, the coming of Christ is not at hand. It is not imminent. Say, what? He says, 
Two things have to happen before Christ comes back. I said, you read the Bible, but sometimes I guess you're on a speed read and you just miss exactly what it's saying. He says, the first thing, before Christ returns, there's going to be a falling away. Apostasy. And if you're filling in the blanks, I think that's the first opportunity to get I call it the great apostasy. And the Bible says that God allows those of the apostasy to be deceived through a strong delusion that they'll believe a lie. You know, you can look back and you can see, uh, and you look in the history of the church, yeah, there's always been people who once acknowledged Christ and just walked away from the faith. But our postmodern culture is adamantly against the truth. In fact, now, our secular nation, because I can identify with what's happening here, is that what is truth? It's pluralistic. Truth is what I decide what truth is. And so what we're doing as a nation, as a people, we're moving away from biblical absolutes. We're redefining what the Word of God says. God says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, He says, I created male and female. And they are to leave their parents and become one. So it is between, in Ephesians, between Christ, in the church, as it is between a male and female, when someone says, I don't like the way God made me, so I'm going to change my identity, change my gender. It's a front towards the nature and the character of God. And we, now what troubles me, there are people who profess to be Christians who are embracing this. I love people. I love people who are adulterers, Murderers, cheaters, homosexuality, the list goes on. But what we can't do is compromise the word of God and we've got to stand on the truth of God's word and not move away from biblical absolutes because we'll fall into that category back in the book of Judges. Every man did that was right in his own eyes. Rebellion against God. That is happening right now. Now, I've heard on the news this is not my notes. This is just coming off the top of my head. <laughs> that, oh, we're not going to invoke our demands and our rights upon people who want to exercise a religious freedom. We're not going to come against the church. Baloney. We war not against principalities and powers. Excuse me. We're war not against flesh and blood. We war against principalities and powers that ungodliness influence the minds of people to receive and buy into a strong delusion where they'll believe a lie and rebel against God and not receive the truth, the gospel of Christ, that they might be saved. Now, when you look at what's happening in our America where we're saying to God, forget you, you're going to do our own thing. And what's happening is an outward rebellion against God and His word and the truth. And so what's happening, that people are being judged. So you see God's judgment begins first in the house of the Lord, and then it permeates the space around the culture. I see that happening now, more so than any time in my life. I'm not making a prediction and say, well, the second coming is going to take place next month, next year. But you're seeing things according to what Paul was saying when he addressed this church, progressive revelation in a sense, that he was saying, before Jesus comes back, there's going to be many who will deny the faith. God's always had a rem remnant. Look in the days of Elijah. When he said, just me, God. I'm the only one. 
He ain't got any one. He's got, got 7,000 of them bowed their knee. God has always had a remnant. You see the teaching of the remnant throughout the scriptures. And even these last days, there'll be rem- a remnant. But you're seeing there's a compromise in the church where there's such a move and pressure on pastors and churches to fill the seat but not really make disciples. Get the people come in the door. You look back in history during the time of the rise of Hitler. Thank God you had some man like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who would not bow his knee, who would not renounce Christ, who stood against evil. And shortly before the fall of Germany, Hitler had him executed. But most of the people, church leaders, succumbed to the government, to the ideology of that time. And Bethany, this preacher here is not going to bend his knee to the devil, to the world, or any government. And we've got to stand with truth. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous sake. The Thessalonians were under severe persecution. Paul spent about three weeks there, and then there was a sect of the Jews who rose up who were angry and said, we've got to get rid of this troublemaker. So they ran him out of town, and he went to Berea. But he left capable people in charge of the church of Thessalonica. And they were upset because... They misunderstood some writings, some teachings of Paul, and they thought the second coming was imminent. And he said, no. First, there's got to be a falling away. I think as you see God's judgment upon this earth and, I, and upon this nation, I pray, God, in the midst of your judgment, show mercy. Amen? It's not to frighten you into heaven, <laughs> but preparation. Amen? to stand firm and let God see and use you. The second thing that must happen before the return of Christ, he says, you're going to see a revelation of the spirit of Antichrist. And he makes reference to this wicked person. He calls him the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, You see the wicked one. And he makes reference to that. When you look at the spirit of Antichrist, you have to go to the book of 1 John and 2 John. There's four references to Antichrist. Interesting, the Apostle John, he makes reference to Antichrist. He says the Antichrist shall appear, but there are many Antichrists. He talks about Antichrist in a singular sense, but primarily in a plural sense. He says the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. And you can see as I begin to unfold, explain that, the spirit of Antichrist denies the flesh and the divinity of Christ. And that's been an age-old battle in the church of those who emphasize one aspect of Christ as opposed to the other Jesus was both flesh and spirit, human and God. Deny the incarnation. Deny the first coming. So I'm probably going to die even the second coming. And the Bible tells us that that spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. When you look back at history, you can see Chaos Caligula, who tried to erect an image of himself in the in the temple of God. Spirit of Antichrist embraced that guy. You can see it also in other leaders, both religious and secular, over a period of time. Recently, in our day and time, you've seen the spirit of Antichrist in Jim Jones. He took 912 people with him in Guyana, South America, when he said, And they were deceived and drank that poison and died within five minutes. Charles Manson said that he was the Christ. Jesus said in these last days, at that time, and even up to today, you see many people embracing the spirit of Antichrist. 
they don't have to be a national figure. Just people who oppose Christ, the gospel, and the teachings of the Lord. That spirit of Antichrist has permeated our culture, even today. But Paul says, there yet got to be a revelation. And it seems he makes reference to a singular person. And he's saying this, this person, he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. He sits in the temple of God claiming to be God. He will deceive people with counterfeit power, signs, and lying wonders. He will be revealed, exposed, when the restrainer is removed, and he will be destroyed by the splendor and the glory glory of the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is where a lot of controversy comes into play right here. If people get confused on the doctrine of Antichrist and they're always looking to the future for this revelation. I remember Hal Lindsey wrote that book back in the 70s. He said he's born in the Middle East right now. Where well, Where is he? You know? You've seen there's a lot of people unknown people, known people who manifest things that are against God Almighty, against Christ, and a rebellion against God. Our current president has made several executive orders which are not of God, which are against the teachings of God's Word. And, you know, I want to be careful that, that I don't become so analytical that I can miss what God is saying and doing, that I've focused myself on this one singular individual. Interesting that it says that he positions himself in the temple of God, saying that he is God. When you are systematic in your theology and you look at the writings of Paul, what did he say or identify as being the temple of God? Was it a building in the Middle East? No. And you got Christians who are trying to resurrect the temple of God in the Middle East. I ran into some people about 15 years ago who were raising red heifers to reincarnate or reconstruct the ashes of the red heifer so you could be cleansed when you touch something undead. And I said, my goodness, are you nuts? Take that money and put it to good use and use it to preach the gospel instead of raising a bull. I wanted to say, you're full of bull, but they're already getting upset with me and wanted to say, you got the spirit of Antichrist or something, you know. But, <laughs> I mean, people, uh, you know, everyone needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And don't become so narrow-minded in your efforts to honor God. And when you look at the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know we not that ye, that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Amen. So, how do you clearly in, interpret this scripture? He tries to position himself in being in the temple of God, calling himself to be God. These things have to happen before the return of Christ. So my theology concerning the imminent return of Jesus Christ had to change. I had to re-examine. Now, as I mentioned earlier, as a believer in Christ Jesus, you will not miss out on the second coming. Amen? I probably got maybe 20 more years, and I'm going to give up the ghost because we all live 20 more years, no matter where you are chronologically. 20 more years, I'll be 88. If I can't be used for God, get me out of here. Amen? And I'll come back with you when the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen? But I know that it seems like things are speeding up and moving rapidly. If this so-called wicked one is a literal person or symbolic, it's going to accomplish what God has ordained in the scriptures 
Because here's one thing, when Jesus comes back, and He spells it out clearly in the Gospels, He says, I send my angels four corners of the earth, I gather everyone together, I separate the wheat from the tares, the sheep from the goats. And the enemy trying to oppose God can't get a million man Chinese army to come against the saints. Just at the appearance of Jesus, this wicked one, this son of perdition, this antichrist is, boom, obliterated. Who in the world can think they can take an AK-47 and fight God? I mean, come on. And so, he's reassuring these saints, look, you're being persecuted, you're going to suffer for righteous sake, these things will happen, and then Christ will return. But I want to comfort you, reassure you, establish you in the faith, because the most important thing that you can do in your life is to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, you're King of kings and Lord of lords. A follower of Jesus, sold out to Jesus, will examine their time, their finances, and say, My priority is God and His kingdom. Not me, not my way, my activities, my thoughts. God, you're first and foremost. I want to fulfill what you call me to do, be faithful to you, trust you, walk with you each and every day. I thank you, Lord, that you incorporated me. And I'll be present at the second event. But I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to let God use me the touch of the hearts and lives. Church, you need to focus in on your family. When we dedicated this little boy this morning, we challenged those parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, live for God. If Micah starts to go the wrong way, I know his mama and I know his grandmama are going to grab a hold of him and wear his behind out. Amen? Don't say, now we want you to be a sweet little boy and don't do the wrong thing. Look, you do the wrong thing. Whack! Ooh, I got that message. Hallelujah. God does that to you and me. When you misbehave, he takes you to the red building out back, the outhouse backyard and beat the snot out of you. And I want to tell you two things that keep me in line. The love of God and the fear of God. Woo! Glory to God. If you have those things working, you're going to do the right thing. You're going to prefer others over yourself. You're going to be Christ-like. You're going to say, God, you can interrupt my schedule, my vacation, my whatever, so I can do what you call me to do. Amen? We don't need to be fearful of what the world has to say. I think because we have told God to get out of our schools in the late, mid-60s, 1973 sanctioned the legalization of killing the innocent, and now parent, but, uh, plant, Planned Parenthood has been caught selling baby parts. I mean, that sounds like the Third Reich being resurrected. Uh, and now the Supreme Court says we want to just tolerate everything and move away from biblical principles and essentially trying to redefine marriage, let alone the other things that are happening. There are some tough days ahead. But I'll tell you what, judgment is not God's annihilation of the earth. Judgment is to bring people to a place of repentance. And if I have to go through a hard time myself, or you have to, so I can be a strong witness towards my children and grandchildren, I'm going to take up my cross and follow Jesus. Amen? You see, we want to preach the prosperity, easy, altar grace gospel. Everything's going to be fine. God will grace you. You can do whatever you want to. Bull baloney. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. 
Amen. You've got to have a balance. The law of God and the grace of God work together. Amen. You want to get caught in antinomianism where people nowadays are saying, no law. I'm totally under grace. Bad news. It's the law of God. The knowledge of sin that leads me to the, I need a Savior. I say to people who are trying to struggle with trying to take the Word of God and twist it to make it fit their ungodly behavior, everyone needs to die to something. Everyone has a propensity. Everyone has a struggle. It might be womanizing. It might be of the same sexual gender. It may be of this addiction or that. Let it die. Deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow Jesus. Be a follower of Jesus. Amen.